Welcome to Join News Today. I am Daniel Dazi. Great to have you with us. In our first story, state prosecutors have told an Accra Circuit Court that investigations into the men's gold scandal is at an advanced stage, but they will need more time to commence trial. Men's Gold CEO Nana Pia Mensa and four others are facing 61 charges, including money laundering, unlawful deposits taken, and sale of minerals without license. Court correspondent Joseph Akable was in court as a request by prosecutors for a long adjournment was turned down. He joins us with more. Joseph, what reason did prosecutors give for the request? In fact, he explained that uh, since they started investigating the matter, uh, they are currently at an advanced stage. They are not at a level where they can tell the court that they are ready to provide all the required documents to enable the trial to commence. And so uh, they have asked that if the magistrates will allow for some more time, preferably a long adjournment sometime in January uh, 2020, before uh, the trial progress. But the concern from the, the effect that as it is a matter that they have been investigated for so long, and so if they are not ready to proceed with a trial, why did they even proceed with charging and put him for the court? The story was to the effect that uh, it was the case of prosecution that investigations that indeed got into an advanced stage that they intended to amend the charge sheet, which was have been So Joseph, when is the next date? The next date uh, is December 23. Give us an update, Joseph, on the alleged school plotters. I'm currently at Kanishi District Court where uh, some of the accused have been brought in. Just some of the court hearing of that particular case, Daniel. Right. Um, so we'll join you later for those updates when we have them. Thanks very much, Joseph Akable. Um, you're still live on Join News today. I am Daniel Dazi. We'll go on with the news. And the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, has cut sword for the reconstruction of Jitasekan Dodo Pepersu Road. Um, the road, which is part of the Eastern Corridor stretch, has last seen any major construction over 14 years ago. This has led to a number of accidents, loss of lives and properties, and increased maintenance costs for both private and commercial vehicle owners. The 56.4 kilometer stretch, when completed, is expected to reduce travel time and facilitate the carton of goods and services from the countryside to urban centers. Our OT regional correspondent, Peter Senu, was at the sword cutting ceremony and has sent the following report. The also known as the N2 runs through the Volta, OT Northeast and the Upper East regions. The road which has suffered several political divorce and deterioration, is now being constructed with funding through Ghana Sino Hydro Master Project Support Agreement. The road minister, Akwesi Amakwata, mentions some benefits residents in the area would enjoy when the road is reconstructed. The construction works of the 56.4 kilometer Jackson Dodo Pepperson section of the Eastern Corridor Road which is one of the Sandro Hydro projects is estimated to cost 45 billion United States dollars and is scheduled to be completed in 20 months from the day of shortcut. The bad nature of this road which has led to several accidents, loss of life, farm produce and even death as a result of delay in assessing health care will all come to an end when this project is completed within the scheduled period. The project we entered will significantly reduce vehicle operation costs, travel time and accident. It will also improve access to social economic facilities such as markets, schools and clinics, which will invariably translate into higher standard of living of the people in these communities along the project corridor like the African, KGB, Menesu, Kwasi, Cement, Kutu, Mkwanta, Ahemesu, Dodo, Papasi, Tapa, Janshin, and Dodo Papasu. He also appeals to residents demonstrating over bad roads across the country to consider not blocking roads and burning lorry ties during such demonstrations since it violates the law. The Vice President, Dr. Mohamed Baumia, cut sword for the reconstruction of the Jassikai Dodo Pepesu Road. 
for the project with a contract sum of 45 million US dollars is expected to last for 36 months. Peterson for Joy News. Now a tour of one of Ghana's cleanest hospitals where patients claim the environment alone can heal. Hospitals are supposed to be places to get health care. Unfortunately, many of those healthcare centers tend to be places where you could pick dangerous infections as a result of factors including poor sanitation. But there's a hospital in the Volta region town of Ho, considered one of the cleanest in Ghana. That's the Ho Tijan Hospital, which continues to win the admiration of patrons. Volta region correspondent Fred Kwame Asari has been touring the facility and has come through with this report. A serene environment greets you right from the entrance of the 200-bed facility, serving the Volta region. It was commissioned by former President Jerry John Rawlings in December 2000 as the Volta Regional Hospital. The facility nicknamed Trafalgar was recommissioned as the Hotitian Hospital in 2018 to serve as a practical center for medical students. Its establishment rejuvenated healthcare delivery in the area, serving as referral facility to hundreds of health centers. About 400 clients visit the facility, which generates about 9,000 tons of solid waste daily. Due to this, management has adopted what it calls the preventive maintenance model to ensure a hygienic environment for safe health delivery. Solomon Jameshi is the estate manager for the facility. At the hospital, we have a maintenance schedule for all what we do in this hospital. Right from the cleanliness of the hospital, the sweeping from the grounds up to the ward for preventive maintenance. So we have a preventive maintenance schedule for what we do at the hospital here. And we follow it. A sanitation team of 69 personnel are obliged to maintain a hygienic environment at the hospital where proper waste disposal is practiced. Labeled bins are situated at vantage points to collect infectious waste separately from general waste. Infectious waste is incinerated, while the general waste is disposed of with the assistance of a private company. We have the internal storage, both for the general waste and the infectious waste. So they store it internally, temporarily. And when it's three-quarter full, then they now send it for the external storage. So with the external storage, they have both the yellow container for the infectious waste and the, the black one. And sometimes we have the blue ones, they are all for general waste. And they send the waste to the external storage. Mm. And from there, the, our workers, the devoted staff, they come early in the morning. One person will come and do all the collection from the external storage. And we have another bigger storage at the incinerator site, which serves like a transfer station for the waste storage. So we separate them, the yellow ones will be separated from the, the black ones. The black ones are the infectious ones. So we have a skip container outside where we put the, the general waste. And the yellow ones and the infectious ones, those are the ones that we incinerate, we put into the incinerator and we incinerate early in the morning before workers come to us so that the, the smoke that has been generated don't disturb them. Here at the Hotison Hospital, the practice of hand hygiene is paramount. There are sinks at every ward to ensure workers regularly wash their hands to control the spread of germs. The hospital's waste management culture earned the cleanest hospital award in 2017. This feat was achieved through the support of the nursing staff. However, the nurse in charge of the emergency ward, Seriam Fiaka, Lament staff ditching their ultimate duties to engage in cleanup impedes their healthcare delivery. The main issue is with the human resource. We're having a big challenge with our orderlies. We don't have enough orderlies in the world. So there are instances where even the nurses have to even do the cleaning. So that's the main challenge here. We practically are the, we add up to clean up the, the ward, which is because it's an emergency ward. The priority is to save lives. So if the expertise are there, if the nurses and the doctors are focusing on their clients, then the orderlies are also doing the cleaning up. With a serene environment, patients are always happy to be here to seek health care. 
As you can see behind me, there are trees around, so that in the afternoon you have a very cool environment to relax. There yeah, are lawns are neatly uh, moved, the flowers are well taken off. So I think when it comes to the environment, the environment is clean, it depicts uh, and a, a hospital environment. Oh yeah, they keep the place nice, the environment, everything is neat over here. The Deputy Director of Administration, Dr. Lord Mensa, however, wants the public to support the facility to maintain the current situation. Um, the hospital is poised to become one of the innovative places that service delivery can take place without any problem. Um, we are looking at sanitation, like I said. We want to improve on the system in such that hygiene is properly observed in every aspect of service delivery. But we would also want to look at other stakeholders coming in to help us to deliver service. Reporter for Joy News, Fred Kwame Asari, who... Next time you're in Ho, maybe you'd like to pass by, not only if you're sick, but to check out that hospital. Away from that, he aspires to be a lawyer, but 18-year-old Ebo, as we choose to call him, is uncertain about his dream because he's HIV positive. Ebo is currently on the last line of treatment due to lack of care and support. That notwithstanding, he will not allow his rights to education to elude him. As Ghana marks 30 years of signing on to the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child today, Ebo is soliciting your support to enable him get the needed education to realize his dream. Yeah, I cannot even walk. Yeah, I cannot even eat. I cannot even talk. So I, I cannot do anything. A boy is an orphan. His parents died from HIV AIDS. He was infected by his parents. The now frail looking SHS graduate learned of his status while in SHS too. He tells me it was devastating. Most of the times, I fall sick. Even I, uh, most of the times, I collapse. And they take me, uh, they put me to a uh, uh, to taxi and they send me home. Lack of family support, love and care have, however, caused Ebo's health to deteriorate faster than expected. With a lot of difficulty, Ebo tells me how the condition threatens his aspirations. Uh, I want to become a lawyer in future, but because of my sickness, eh, 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 well, I, 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 I don't know what to say. Ebo is among the almost 40,000 children living with HIV AIDS in Ghana. But their right to good education, health, shelter and clothing are not guaranteed due to stigma and weak social support system. In spite of these limitations, Ebo's education remains key to him. Well, I want the person to support me in my education. Yeah, the education is my, uh, the, my first wish, yeah, and support me in uh, nutrition and, uh. What these people need is our care and support. If we can give them care and support, why, and they need this care. Sense. They, they have no hand in this. They were infected by their parents, and these parents are no more. And therefore, somebody must give them care, and I think we are the ones to give them care. Most children living with HIV in Ghana are living with their grandparents, caregivers, orphanages, or on the streets. The situation often deprives them of the required nutrition, medical treatment, love, and support. As the country takes stock of its performance in the last 30 years of promoting child rights, you might want to do something in your little corner to make the world a better place for the Ghanaian child. Emma Atiamo Eli for Joy News, Accra. Heartbreaking there, but hopeful. Now, on the issue of good health, education, and the right to identity, the UNICEF Director for West and Central Africa, Marie-Pierre Poirier, told um, Joy News that Ghana can do more in reducing the inequality gap um, which deprives children of their rights. 
What you mentioned en passant, because it was obvious to you, kindergarten, that's not the norm on the continent, and Ghana is there. And I'm just coming back from Upper East, and I've seen really innovative technique just so that the kids don't go to the kindergarten, but they learn there. And there are projects supported by the regions and by the central ministry here, where volunteer mothers uh, accompany the teachers and play games and have very innovative methodologies so the children learn. So that investment in kindergarten that for Ghana is, a, is a, you know, obvious, is, is something you could teach to the others. What we know about the schools is being enrolled in school is not sufficient for children to learn. And where Ghana is trailing behind is in the learning. The kids spend all the time, you manage your access indicator. They do go, but they don't learn, and then some of them drop out. We are looking with the government at what could be done about this. Um, and um, uh, very innovative ideas. First of all, particularly for the girls, you were mentioning child marriage and girls dropping out. A, a simple thing, sanitation facilities. If you don't have a sanitation facility in the school, particularly for the girls in specific moments of the month, how embarrassing. Maybe they would like to go home and then they don't come back. Sanitation facilities separated for girls and boys will do a long way to make sure that the kids stay there. The ambiance in the school, the safety in the school, and Ghana is a member of the Safe Code Initiative, that is great. And in the countries of the region, which have adopted this by mobilizing the teachers and mobilizing the young people and the young women to know what's acceptable, what's not, that is making a difference to keep them there. And uh, the experience of other countries is when young women, young girls stay in school longer, that has an impact on the age of marriage. Now, Minister for Gender, Children and Social Protection, Cynthia Morrison, joined a host of child right advocates to light the gate to the Black Star Square Blue in commemoration of 30 years of Ghana's promotion of child rights. He, she called for a renewed commitment for child rights advocacy. Convention of the Rights of a Child, CRC, is the most widely ratified human rights treaty in the history and has helped to transform children, their lives around the world. We are proud to associate with the 30 years of the rights of the child in Ghana with monuments as we light up the gate. We call on all of you in Ghana to renew their commitment towards the protection of all our beautiful children that God has given us. We call for a new era for the protection of children an era of adequate resources for children, protection issues, an extra, an era for represent responsible parenthood, an era for a full implementation of the law protecting our children, an era where children have a peace of mind and happiness they need to grow up responsibly. Now, away from that story, rice farmers at Fumbisi in the Bulsa South District of the Upper East Region are appealing to government to provide market storage facilities for their massive rice harvest this year. While some of the farmers are unable to find markets for their produce or good storage facilities, others are selling at giveaway prices because the markets are flooded with imported rice sold at relatively lower prices. Journalist Eva Atiboka toured the rice, valley, the rice valleys and observed the farmers had harvested and bagged about 60,000 maxi bags of rice and left them in the open because of lack of storage facilities and readily available market. I have harvested about 150 and then the rest 150 is still sitting there. In fact, uh, I have a, a breakdown of a combined harvester, which one, two, we don't have any part in the country. Anything that is breakdown, you have to send it to uh, China. You have to import it from China. Before it reached, the rice have gone bad. But now either I'll get, I'll get somebody to be hired to continue or finally fire will have to come and harvest. The amazing link is that we address problems in silos. Agriculture is a system. 
and we don't have a systemic approach. So the mechanism for increasing output seems to be a reasonable response, good response. There's no functioning warehousing system. And there is no solution to markets. We do not have an arrangement where the state intervenes in a massive buying exercise, for example, for strategic stocks that enables pricing to be stabilized in the glut period. Now, the Deputy Regional Director of Agriculture, however, says they are working on getting combined harvesters to help the farmers clear their farms. It, it is. The Ministry has taken steps to do that one. This year, some few combined harvesters came, and we are expecting that next year a lot will come. Next year, a lot will come that will be given to the farmers. Is it because these things are not produced in the country and when you order it takes some days or months before they arrive. When that is what they do. Ahead? That is why. It, it was last last year you were sure that at least you will get them this year. This and this year too we didn't. Ages. Yes. It, it ages but it takes a, <laughs> but I am assured that they, our, our minister is actually up to that. And again, we are trying to move away from the heavy machines to look at the simple, simple machines that are available. So that, he, and he has assured us that by, by next year, a lot of them will arrive in the country. Simple, simple circles to actually harvest their rice, not the combine harvest. Particularly for those who do the large acreage, and now that you are even having the rains, the ordinary combine cannot even go into, so, so you need the crawler type. So if you go to the Navrongo, it is the crawler type that we use, that they can go through the water and the harvest as well. So that all will not be man, but we are looking for the simple, simple machines that our farmers can use it themselves and then do the harvesting. So, so the that, that have come in, where are they? Where have you taken those ones? No, the few that are, in fact, the, unfortunately, the combines were not part. The combine were not, they, they arrived before the planting season and they were the cultivators for the lamp preparation and all those things you know? but the harvested rice harvested itself that, that. So you're but the shell is, uh, yes you you buy me our share. you are yet to have they are yet to do the distribution no uh, for the planters and all those things oh, no, they, are, they have started but our region has not gotten yet you because have region wide. yes you see the thing to we have to get a a private man who is already inside there to take the lead and then the things will be supplied to. So now the Upper East Regional Minister Paulina Patience Abayagi says the government is working towards completing warehouses to cater for storage of produce. Well, have not. Yeah. So because we have that much, you know, um, you are aware that we are building, what is that, warehouses. In fact, the minister mentioned the warehouses. Wow. What? Yes, yes. We have nine of them currently ongoing in the region. The only thing is that we haven't completed them yet. What this means for us as a government is push hard, push hard, push hard, and finish this, uh, what is that, if, even if we finish these nine warehouses, that is, which, each warehouse takes a thousand metric tons. That alone will be 9,000 metric tons. We should be. No, but a lot of them are about 90% complete. Most of the warehouses are about 90% complete in this region. So you push for them? Exactly. And in fact, in fact, the contractors are only running behind time. So it's not as if, as if, as if, uh, even in, as for Yagaba, we have some that, are, that we have a warehouse that is completely uh, finished. So we, we, that is it. The ministry and uh, was well, a buffer stock. I have to push for them to finish this as, and then uh, ministry for special initiative finish this as quickly as possible so that we can take in the the extra uh, extra harvest. The good thing about this. Uh, warehouses is that it's not just for government even individuals who like to store for future purpose can go and store in those warehouses and then maybe uh, as and when here in adequate, looking at what the planting for food and jobs has been able to do rice farming has been massive i went there and i was there. <laughs> yeah don't worry so the thousand metric tons is heavy 
That's enough. So, and I'm saying we have nine currently, nine warehouses. And the, and the, 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 the one that hasn't gone any far will be about 60%. Most of them are 90, 95, 80. It's just to fix the doors and f the ventilators. Uh -huh. They are almost complete. Maybe you can, I can, I can let you visit when on your way. Just ask for the Talent CDC. You can visit his warehouse. If the one you will see in the Talent C district will represent about 60% of the ones we have, so that you can take a look at them. And then we'll take. So we'll push for that. But I agree that uh, we have a bumper harvest, and once you have a bumper harvest, you've got to find a way of not letting the farmers regret farming and then harvesting so much. Early on news desk, head of programs and advocacy of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana, Charles Nyaba noted, uh, farmers stand to lose thousands of cities if governments does not intervene in the situation. I can just give you an estimate of what myself and the other members of Peasant Farmers have put on the plot where we are farming. We have 500 acres, myself and our group, that we did there. To plow an acre and then harrow, it will take 200 Ghana cities. Okay. Before you plow, you would have gone to clear the land. Yes. Mm -hmm. We buy seeds, and the government subsidized seeds was 80 cities for the mini bags. We need about um, four of that for an acre. And then we buy fertilizer, three bags. The subsidized fertilizer, uh, the 15, 15, 15, was uh, 70 five Ghana cities, and the sulfate of ammonia is 70 cities. So you put the two together, 145 Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. After that, you need labor to go and do the broadcasting of the fertilizer. You need to go and control the weeds by spraying by the uh, weedy size. Then the combined harvester to harvest one acre is 400 Ghana, Ghana cities. cities. Just one. You need to also have labor who will go and spread the rice to dry, and then women will come to do feather winnowing. Then people who load it into the truck for you to take it to the next stage where it is going to be dry. So that is the quantum of expenditure that we've made so far. Yeah. So this is the amount of investment that is going to go wasted. Now the appointment of the new Director General of the Ghana Health Service has been withdrawn. Information available to Joy News indicates that there were agitations by some pro-NPP medical doctors at Konfanochi Teaching Hospital that Dr. Bafwewa was not a real party member. It's been less than two weeks since uh, Dr. Bafwewa was appointed as Director General of the Ghana Health Service. No reasons, according to him, have been assigned for the revocation of his appointment. Let's get on to some details. Now, on to, until his appointment, Dr. Bafwewa worked at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital from 1990 to March 2018, where um, when he was seconded to the Ministry of Health as Special Advisor to the Minister of Health in Accra on human resource issues. The medical doctor who comes from the Upper Dintra West Town, um, a Upper Dintra West Town, rose through the ranks of the medical profession as medical officer, a specialist and consultant. In his almost 30 years of service, he has not enjoyed full annual leave because he had been prevailed upon to stay because of shortage of staff any time his leave was due. The radiation oncologist started the oncology center at CAF in 2000 in 2004, where he worked single-handedly until 2008, where he obtained accreditation to train specialists oncologists. Still, I have enjoyed news today. It's time for business. We'll be right back. <laughs>